In 1707, Admiral Sir Cloudsley Shovel, the commander of a large fleet of ships, suffered a significant navigation error. He was attempting to return to Great Britain, but the combination of foggy weather and rudimentary navigation techniques led to severe consequences. The problem was that in 1707, sailors were virtually unable to establish their longitude. Admiral Shovel did not realize that he was near land, and his fleet ran aground on the coast of the Scilly Isles. His boats began to sink, and almost 2,000 men fell to a watery grave. All of this could have been prevented with one simple invention, but it would be 66 years until navigation became simpler and more practical. This pressing issue, the cause of Admiral Shovel's crash, was known as the Longitude Problem. Amidst the growing trade wars and global commercial competition, Europe's navigational longitude problem was overcome by the revolutionary invention of the marine chronometer. The marine chronometer was met with sharp reaction among the scientific community, which searched for a solution through astronomy. But due to English royal support, it gradually reformed sailing, industry, and politics over the next 250 years. In the 18th century, advances in astronomy had made the calculation of latitude easy, which was largely dependent on the position of the North Star. However, the calculation of longitude, especially on the open seas, was far more difficult. Because of the rotation of the Earth, there is no consistent star or group of stars on which to base calculations. Instead, sailors were forced to base their calculations off arbitrary factors such as the speed of the boat, the tides, and the winds. This time period was known as the Age of Sail, and all trans-oceanic travel and trade depended on shipping. Without a means to establish longitude, sailors were forced to either stick to well-known routes and risk attack by pirates, or stray from the known routes and risk getting lost or becoming shipwrecked. All the greatest minds of the time, including Newton and Galileo, believed that an answer to the longitude problem would be found in the night sky. The Greenwich Observatory was commissioned by King Charles II in 1675 to map the night sky in hope of solving the longitude problem. But no one was ever able to find a practical solution. One of the problems with relying on stars is that they can only be seen on a clear night. Also, the calculations necessary were far too complicated, and a simple observation error would severely distort the calculation, leading to disastrous results. Some scientists had proposed using a clock to solve the longitude problem. In theory, a sailor could use an accurate chronometer to record the time when leaving port, usually Greenwich, England. Then, when he needed to know his longitude, he could use the sun to figure out local time. By comparing the reading on his clock to local time, the sailor could figure out his longitude. Because there are 24 hours in a day, for every hour that the sun appears to move across the sky, a sailor will have traveled 1 24th of the way around the circumference of the Earth. Because there are 360 degrees in a circle, one hour in time is equal to 15 degrees of longitude. So, all the sailor would need to do is subtract local time from Greenwich time to find the difference in hours, and multiply that number by 15 degrees to figure out the degrees in longitude. In the early 16th century, um, Gamma Frisius had proposed using two clocks, but the clocks of that time were far from accurate enough to be put to that use. And for um, I mean, various people tried to build clocks that would work at sea, including Galileo, including Christian Huygens. But Newton was famous for saying that it was much too difficult, that the, the problems of using a clock at sea were never going to be overcome, and that the answer would have to come from astronomy. One method is by a watch to keep time exactly, but by reason of the motion of the ship, the variation of heat and cold, wet and dry, and the difference of gravity in different latitudes, such a watch hath not yet been made. Scientists knew that a clock could solve the problem, but no clock had ever been built that was stable enough to keep time accurately over weeks and months. Furthermore, the conditions of the ocean, such as the rocking motion, winds, and salt water, made clocks even less accurate over extended periods of time. In reaction to the longitude problem, in 1714, Queen Anne and the British Parliament passed the Longitude Act, offering £20,000 for a means of calculating longitude within 30 nautical miles of accuracy. The Board of Longitude was established to evaluate potential solutions. Other countries, such as Spain and the Netherlands, offered similar prizes. The longitude problem was a serious obstacle to navies throughout Europe. A young, self-taught British clockmaker named John Harrison set out to build the first accurate marine chronometer, and thus solved the longitude problem. When Harrison set out to build his first sea clock, there were many problems with creating an accurate marine chronometer to meet sailing needs at the time. 
Pendulums were a must for any clock during his day, but the undulations of the sea distorted the movements of the pendulum. Clockmakers had not yet figured out how to stop changes in temperature and pressure from causing the small metal parts in clocks from expanding and distorting. Harrison solved these problems and others with his first attempt at the Longitude Prize, the revolutionary sea clock known as the Harrison 1, or H1. This clock used balances to stabilize the clock despite the rocking of the boat, and had a device that would regulate the temperature inside the clock. When Harrison arrived in London in 1730, the Board of Longitude had never met. No one had come up with an idea feasible enough for the board to feel compelled to gather. Harrison met with the board, and the H1 was successfully tested on a voyage to Portugal and back. Harrison gradually revised his clocks, making them more and more accurate while making them smaller and smaller. Finally, Harrison produced the truly revolutionary H4, which was the smallest clock yet, weighing mere ounces instead of pounds. The H4 passed its sea trial to Jamaica, achieving only half the error permitted over twice the distance required by the Longitude Act. Unfortunately for Harrison, the scientific community of the time was not ready to accept the marine chronometer as the solution to the longitude problem. Competing with the chronometer was the lunar distance method, which involved calculating angles between the moon and stars. This method was developed by Neville Maskelyne, Royal Astronomer and Board of Longitude member. Maskelyne, eager to see Harrison fail, tested the H4 again and found that it did not meet the requirements. For the most part, astronomers rejected the idea that a mechanical device could aid navigation, and were determined to find a solution using the stars. They resented Harrison's ingenuity of the practicality of a clock. Ever since Newton had claimed that clocks could not feasibly solve the longitude problem, scientists had a strong prejudice against clockmakers. Thus, Maskelyne refused to believe that a simple clockmaker could have solved the problem that England's greatest astronomers had failed to solve. In response to the volatile reaction against his clock, Harrison contacted King George III. The king conducted his own trial at his palace and found that Harrison's clock was accurate enough to meet the board's standards. Harrison and his son have been cruelly wronged. By God, Harrison, I will see you righted. The king intervened, and the board reluctantly awarded Harrison a sum of money exceeding £20,000. Harrison died in 1776, a multi-millionaire by today's standards. Before Harrison's revolution could be complete, his brilliant invention needed to be mass-produced. This reform came at the hands of John Arnold and Thomas Earnshaw. Arnold and Earnshaw used Harrison's technical achievements to maintain an accurate clock design, but worked to make the final product cheaper and easier to produce. Before, only the wealthiest admirals could afford a chronometer, but with cheap mass production, the sailing industry quickly implemented marine chronometers into thousands of ships. This marvel of mass production is equally important to the revolution in navigation as Harrison's technical advances. Shipping was the only mode of transatlantic trade at the time. England, France, and Spain had been fighting extensive trade wars all over the globe as they competed for colonial trade. The invention of the marine chronometer reformed Britain's navy by giving them a cheap, easy, and accurate method of determining longitude. The marine chronometer was first implemented by the British, and in the short term after its invention, Britain became the dominant naval power in Europe. British merchants, many of whom implemented the chronometer, helped to establish a vast empire of trade before competing countries. In particular, the British East India Company was one of the first consumers of the chronometer, and fully implemented its technology by the early 19th century. The combination of war and trade led to the supremacy of the British Empire, and was partially due to an early advantage in navigation technology. Eventually, as other countries struggled to compete with Britain, much of the non-European world became subject to the few technologically supreme countries in the 19th century. The revolution of the marine chronometer led to a new age of discovery. The invention reformed sailing by giving captains the tools they needed to accurately chart the seas, explore unmapped waters, and discover new trade routes. One of the first sailors to use the chronometer was Captain James Cook. With the help of the chronometer, Cook mapped Australia, discovered Antarctica and Hawaii, and mapped coastlines across the oceans. Cook acclaimed the chronometer, calling it our never-failing guide. The major political impact of this achievement was the British colonization of Australia, one of many new acquisitions in the age of imperialism. The revolutionary marine chronometer was the primary tool in navigation for over 150 years. Eventually, this technological marvel gave way to new, more accurate devices, but it marked an important turning point in navigation. Thanks to the marine chronometer, we'll never be quite so lost at sea again.